Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Inept General bringing you a Total War Warhammer 2 Missing Legendary Lords video. And today we are going to be focusing on the faction of the High Elves and looking at some of the possible legendary lords that never made it into the game. And we probably won't see for a long time, but you know, further down the road, you never know what might happen and some of these fantastic characters might make an appearance. So the way this video is going to work today is I'm going to go through some of the characters, probably in order of, I think, most likely to least likely of them appearing at some future point in the Total War Warhammer franchise. And we're going to start things off with the legendary Captain of the White Lions, Corhill. Now, we're starting with Corhill because I think there's maybe an argument to be made that he's in a way in the game already. The character of Alistair, a general you can recruit to the Laferne faction of the High Elves, has a lot of similarities with Corhill. And I know he was the desire of a Make a Wish kid, but if Creative Assembly were going to make a Core Hill, short of putting a smaller axe in his hand, he'd almost look exactly like the Alistair character in the game already. So one could argue, just rename him, you've kind of got him without the additional weapon in his hand. So that's why I put him first on this list, not because he's necessarily number one ranked most likely, but because he's kind of in the game in some form already. There's a lot of similarities there. That's why we're leading off with Core Hill. Now, Corhill began his life as a Kratian hunter. Um, we presume he's Kratian, although the sources directly saying he always was are a little bit sparse, but he's described in sentences along with other Kratian hunters towards the beginning of his story. He was already a young, strong warrior stroke hunter. He thought, you know, in perhaps in young arrogance, that he could do something that had seemed impossible. There had been rumors of a tale of a mighty Kratian lion that had been afflicted by the touch of chaos and had mutated into a monstrous beast that's already said to have claimed the lives of many other Kratian hunters who have gone missing in recent times. So this young, strong Kratian hunter, Corhill, is like, all right, I think I can do this, and sets off into the wilderness undaunted to find this beast. Now, he came across the animals in the mountains of Kras, its lair surrounded by the corpses of other hunters, of elven victims, bones laid around the opening of a small cave as suddenly the beast erupted from within, charging straight at Corhill, mad with bloodlust. Corhill, quick for such a big elf, dodged out the way and started raining down blows upon the beast with his axes. But the beast's skin had been so mutated and thickened, it was like striking against the hardest of armors. And after some time, he realized his blows were having no effect whatsoever. So he set down his weapons and shifted strategy. Now, the way the legend plays out most commonly is that having thrown down his weapons, he started wrestling with the beast as its claws dug into his flesh, tearing at him, causing him horrible wounds. But he managed to get around the beast's neck and start to throttle it, its spasm and body writhing around in the Corhill's arms as it took all his strength just to keep it in place and keep his arms latched around its neck. Then, after a time, the thrashing died down and the beast fell at Corhill's feet dead. Now, later on, Corhill would tell perhaps the reality of the story a little bit differently, in that when he shifted tactics, what he decided to do was kind of strategically run away, engaging the bees, keep it interested, but pulling it further and further away from its lair until it was exhausted to the point that he could wrestle with it, and that's when he throttled it to death. But, one way or the other, Corhill emerged victorious and cemented his name in the fables of Crace. Once word got around he killed this mighty beast, he was invited to join the White Lions, a unit dedicated to the protection of the Phoenix King, and themselves had a history with the Lions of Kreis, using them as beasts of war or as tests of initiation to get into the White Lions. Having killed this monster of all monsters of Kratian lions, they decided to award Corhill with the pelt of this massive lion that he'd killed and inducted them into their ranks. 
When he joined, he was actually the third youngest white lions ever to be indoctrinated into their ranks. As he was an adolescent, really, when he'd killed this lion, he was still growing, still a growing boy, and he grew into a warrior of immense size and stature, really a veritable giant amongst elves, and his strength matched his immense size. It's said he was capable of taking one of a hydra's heads with a single swing of his axe. Such was his immense power. At this stage, it's thought because he was so strong and still had speed to boot, he decided to take up two weapons as his standard, whereas most white lions will just wield the single double-handed axe. Corhill's immense size and strength meant he could easily wield two weapons at a time when fighting his enemies, and so became slightly known for this throughout the ranks of the White Lions. And so he went on to fight in many battles with the White Lions. By the time the year 2302 rolled around of the Imperial Calendar, some 200 years before the start of the Total War Warhammer timeline, the Battle of the Fenuvial Plains took place. Now this was the battle where the two twins of Teclis and Tyrion rose to prominence and became the heroes defending off one against a dark elf invasion when no others could. They really were to stand out and emerge from that battle. During the course of that battle, the captain of the White Lions was on the battlefield and fell to a dark elf general known as Urien Poisonblade. So this meant that the White Lions were without leadership. Now it seems that the White Lions actually elect their captains, and so Corhill won an overwhelming majority and became the leader of the White Lions. As the captain of the White Lions, he was awarded Cheal, the blade of the captain of the White Lions since their founding. It was a very imposing and beautifully crafted double-headed axe. Ever since that day, he has been the Phoenix King's shadow, his guardian, and his protector, going wherever the Phoenix King wanted him to be and doing his best to protect their noble king against any onslaught or attack. It wasn't long before his services were needed. In the year 2307 of the Imperial Calendar, a cadre of assassins led by a dark elf by the name of Gloria Darkblade had come across to Alf One and made it to Lafern, where the Phoenix King made his home. They made it all the way to the palace and in fact launched an attack against the Phoenix King that was only stopped by the quick reaction of Corhill and the other white lions in attendance who made a wall of bodies between the assassins and the Phoenix King. The assassins could not get a throne blade or stab blade through to the Phoenix King and were repelled away. They started to flee across the rooftops of Lafern, hotly pursued by the white lions following them. Eventually they were all hunted down by the white lions and it was Corhill himself who caught up with Gloria Darkblade and with a single blow felled the nefarious dark elf assassin saving the life of the phoenix king not the last time he would be called upon to perform such a duty he takes great pride in his work and in fact has never failed and almost has a pathological need to never fail such is his devotion to his task He's distinguished himself many times in battle, and another story that went down in Corhill's legend was during the Battle of Tor Acre in the capital of Kreis. Now, this battle involved a huge force attacking the city, and Corhill had to face down against a huge manticore single handed. Now, the beast descended upon Corhill, who got grievously mauled in the initial attack, but had enough strength held back that he timed a perfect swing of his powerful axe that split the beast's belly open, causing its stinking intestines to spill out over the plaza of the city, leaving Corhill victorious but badly wounded, and soon after killing the beast, he passed out himself. But so impressed was the Phoenix King at Corhill killing such an enormous beast that he rewarded him with a gemstone belt that he wears to this day. Now, over the tasks he's completed for the Phoenix King, it's also thought at some point the Phoenix King put a magical enchantment on Corhill's cloak 
of the mutated lion he'd fought in his younger days, causing it to give him extra magical protection. And it was particularly effective against poison, perhaps looking to not repeat the death of his predecessor, who fell to a notorious Dark Elf by the name of Poison Blade, so maybe looking to negate that risk in the future. To be elected captain, Corhill was obviously a truly gifted fighter, with a grace and dexterity that makes the other White Lions look clumsy in comparison. When his two weapons are swinging in motion, his movements have been described as creating a silver web of destruction around himself that crashes through bone and armor alike. Along with this grace and dexterity is his unmatched strength in Elvendom. Truly, he has been discussed as the strongest elf in terms of sheer physical force of all the elves in Ulfwan. But he doesn't let all this praise go to his head, as he's said to have an honest and noble demeanor, and he's made friends in many places around the Warhammer world, as the Phoenix King often tasks him with leading forces to help allies in different parts of the Warhammer world. Amongst these friends, he counts Tyrion as perhaps one of his closest. The two have a kind of friendly rivalry going on, and even Tyrion's known to have thought to himself that a duel between the two would truly be a sight to behold, and he's not a 100% sure of victory himself. In terms of Corhill's rules on the tabletop, he has his two weapons, which count as paired weapons uh, per the tabletop rules. He also has Cheal, which is the blade that was given to him when he became Captain of the White Lions. It has some, it's a sort of enchanted blade that the Captain of the White Lions always has. It's a double-headed axe, and it gives a strength bonus and killing blow on the tabletop. It could give killing blow in Total War Warhammer if he ever makes an appearance, and just maybe be a big boost to weapon strength as well. He also has the Pelt of Tyrandis. That was the name of the lion he had skinned that he beat in his youth and that was enchanted by the Phoenix King. This gave a bonus to saving throws on the tabletop for close combat and an even better bonus to saving throws against shooting. So it should give him some missile resistance and just some melee defense bonus as well as having no ability to poison him. He'd be immune to poison effects in Total War Warhammer if they were going to translate it across accurately. And that is Corhill, the giant amongst elves, the noble warrior that he is, the protector of the Phoenix King. So moving on from Corhill, next up we have Altharion the Grim. Altharion was a kind of known hero amongst the elves, and he was known for leading an excursion to Nagaroth that was at first extremely successful. They started to win victories against the Dark Elves in the Dark Elves' homeland and began to kind of sneak around, causing all kinds of havoc, setting ambushes, really leading a very successful host around Nagaroth. And at one point, Elfarian got maybe, let's say, a bit uh, big-headed, perhaps, and decided to attack the capital city of Nagaroth. And he and his warriors, dressed as Dark Elves, snuck, got past the gates, attacked the gate guards, and opened the gates for the waiting army of High Elves. Now, the High Elves were eventually fought back after Elfarian was injured by a dark elf assassin with a poison blade and the high elf army retreated back to Ulfwan. Once they got back to Ulfwan and the still poisoned Elfarian, who was still suffering dreadfully, got back to Tor Yvres, they found that their own home province was under siege by Greenskin Wa, and this was the Wa of Grom the Ponch. The very famous Gobbo who ate a troll and became an enormous Gobbo. And if you'd like to hear more about Grom the Ponch's entire campaign, do check the top right hand corner now. But Grom was sieging the homelands of Elfarian, and Elfarian's father had gone out to try and stop this war. But the war was just enormous. The High Elves had never seen anything like this, a greenskin war on their own lands, and of such enormous and imposing size as well, that although any High Elf could match a Gobbo in combat easily, the Gobbos just swarmed over them like locusts, just annihilating army after army and raiding and pillaging their lands. Altharion's father, Murian, what marched out against Grom the Ponch, and he was promptly defeated and killed. At the time, Elfarion was unaware of this because no one could really communicate with him. He was just so 
feverish and non-comprehensible, just in the wraps of this poison and what he had done, that he wasn't really aware of the world around him and what was going on. And then suddenly to Eltharion appeared a vision, and it was his father who was bearing all the scars and the wounds of battle. And he spoke to his son and explained the situation. He said, this guy Grom the Ponch has come. He has his lieutenant, the shaman Blacktooth, who is destroying the Waystones, which protect us against chaos magic here in Alf 1. And there's more chaos magic coming to our homeland territory. And it's affecting and it's corrupting the land. You have to put a stop to Grom the Ponch and his evil wizard buddy. And Eltharion suddenly wakes up from his feverish dream to find that where his father had been standing in his dream was the old ancestral blade of his family, Fangsword. And he picked it up and vowed to end the War of Grom. At this point, Grom had kind of marched through the countryside of Yvres and had destroyed many, many waystones, so much so that in fact it's believed if he destroys one more, the entirety of the vortex will collapse and chaos will be unleashed upon the world once more. And the last waystone he wants to destroy is underneath the capital of the region. So Grom and his lieutenant Blacktooth are marching. An army tries to intercept them, led by Elfarian's younger brother, and he is cut down as well. So at this point, Grom has killed Elfarian's father and his younger brother. So Grom continues his march. And for three days and three nights, he lays absolute wreckage upon the city. The greenskin catapults are firing huge boulders into the city. Doom divers are raining down. Vast seas of gobos are just waiting to burst into the gates. And eventually the gates do fall under this incessant and overwhelming power of this greenskin war. And they begin to storm the streets. All appears to be lost. The waystone seems like it's going to be destroyed. Blacktooth, the greenskin mage, is over the city just delighting in his victory and how powerful he's become with the destruction of the waystones, obviously being guided by the chaos forces. And then out of the kind of glint of his eye, Blacktooth just sees something darting towards him and in a last gasp attempt to try and defend himself starts to send some ethereal green fists towards the aggressor but before he knows it whoosh, his head is parted from his shoulders and streaming past him on his griffin Stormwing is Eltharion who has decapitated the greenskin mage just as his troops land on boats into the capital of the city and begin to fight off Grom's war. Grom tries to rally his troops, but in the end, he is a gobbo at heart and gives up and runs away into the hills of the area. Now, Grom hasn't been seen since that day, and that was a very long time ago. Eltharion then took up a quest of making sure that no greenskin war ever threatened his beloved homeland again and took a elven army to the Badlands and began to kill any greenskin he could find. After a while, he won victory after victory, but he began to realize that not understanding greenskin sky psychology particularly well, that by killing all these war bosses, he was just encouraging more wars to pick up, gather troops, and march towards the pointy heads because they were a good bloody fight. So that's what the Greenskins were doing. Upon realizing like what was going on and that he was just encouraging more violence on the Greenskins' part, he took his army and went home and decided to defend off one from there from any kind of Greenskin invasion. Now, Eltharion is one of the few characters and the only one that's popping to my mind right now, there may be others, but the only one popping straight into my head, that actually has a rule on the tabletop against a single other character who is Grom the Ponch. Eltharion on the tabletop hates Grom, determined to see Grom dead above all others. So we mentioned his mount already. He has a griffin, Stormfang. He has his his ancestral sword, the Fang Sword, which does magic damage, and no armor saves can be made against it on the tabletop, essentially meaning it should be very armor piercing in Total War Warhammer 2. He also has the Helm of Yvres, which is the ceremonial helm given to the Wardens, which he was selected to be Warden of the province after he saved it from Grom the Ponch, and so he was awarded this crown, this helm even, 
And it's a magical armor. It gives him better armor and gives him a ward save as well of 33%. His last item is the Talisman of Hoeth, which is a medallion, which essentially allows the wearer magic resistance and it makes you a wizard. So Eltharion is really a fighter, but this medallion makes him a low-level wizard and gives him the magical knowledge of its previous owner, which allows him to use magic. Now, this would essentially allow Eltharion to have a couple of spells on the tabletop, so maybe he has a very limited magical upgrade pool, but he's really able to use magic from all eight laws of magic found in the Total War Warhammer world, but he's a very low-level wizard, so that would limit the number of spells you had on the tabletop, but we haven't really had a limiting factor in terms of numbers of spells in Total War Warhammer. So what I see Creative Assembly doing in this case is maybe just giving him two or three, or maybe at most four spells, or maybe four slots for spells, making them multiple choice. You can kind of pick one or the other and just give you an upgrade. So four slots with one powerful spell from each law of magic, and that's what the Talisman of Hoeth allows him to do. So an interesting kind of melee-focused wizard. So moving on from Eltharion, we have Karadrian. Now, Karadrian started off life as a even conceited for a high elf noble. He was up there, you know, eating grapes on a chaise lounge all day, just having a great time, being just a right royal prick in everyday life, ongoing and continuous. One of the most conceited elves to ever walk the island of Alfwan, and that really is saying something. It got to the point where even his own family looked for ways they could disown him or get rid of him, but they were such sort of staunch traditionalists that they never really built up the courage to do it. So, one day this conceited prince goes off and does the pilgrimage that all elven nobility are expected to do, and that is to go to the shrine of Assyrian. Now, this is where the Phoenix King is coronated, walks through the flames of Assyrian, but, you know, everyone's meant to go and have a look at it. He's off to do this, and in his most conceited, kind of arrogant, sort of lack of respect act ever, he sneaks off from the tour group and goes into what is known as the Chamber of Days, one of the most holy places within the Shrine of Assyrian, reserved really for the Phoenix Guard. It's a place where you can see the future, a sort of past, present, future, all things around you, and it's what Phoenix Guard do, and then they walk out and take their vow of silence, promising never to speak of the things they've seen. So he goes into this room and it locks behind him and basically he disappears for a number of days. People are kind of concerned. They kind of know where he is. They're like, oh, he's going to face harsh punishment. But he walks out with the mark of Assyrian branded into his forehead, marking him as a servant of the god of the elves. So he walks out, immediately gives up all his worldly possessions, just like, nope, take it off me. I don't want my title. I don't want anything from this mortal coil anymore. And then takes the vows to become a phoenix guard and hasn't spoken a word since that. That day. So as a Phoenix Guard, he served honorably, going to the battlefields that they were summoned to, carrying out his meditative responsibilities, thinking on the word of Assyrian. Almost a priestly knight, really, is how the Phoenix Guards operate. During the Battle of the Phanuvial Plain, where Tyrion and Teclis saved the island of Ulfwan from a dark elf invasion, there was a battle in which Caradrian was involved, and he was there fighting on the battlefield when suddenly he saw a Frostheart Phoenix tumble out of the sky, having done battle with a fierce black dragon. He came to the Phoenix's aid and fought off single-handedly the Dark Elves looking to murder the fallen Phoenix. Ever since then, the Phoenix and Caradrian have been firm friends, and in fact, the Phoenix was one known as Ashtari. Now, Ashtari is now thought to be the oldest and wisest of all the Phoenixes, but ever since that day at the Battle of Phanuvial Plains, in the year 2302 of the Imperial Calendar, so some 200 years before the current Total War Warhammer timeline, they have been firm friends, and he has had Ashtari as a mount ever since. Then, sometime after the Battle of Phanuvial Plains, there was messages sent down to the Phoenix Guard that the current captain should kind of step aside, and it was the time of Caradrian to come forward and become the captain of the Phoenix Guard. He spends most of his days sort of looking in the Chamber of 
time reading the fiery letters of the god Assyrian, seeing the future, seeing the present, observing all things. But it's kind of hinted at that there is some degree of interpretation in the future predictions in the Chamber of Days, where it takes a keen mind to make the most sense out of it. And it's thought his gift for perception has made him have much more accurate readings. And as such, really it was one of the factors in placing him as captain of the Phoenix Guard, because he has this gift of being able to interpret the ways that the Phoenix Guard tell the future in a much more accurate and concise way. Apart from whiling away his days meditating in the Chamber of Days, he also is sometimes found just staring for hours out from the tallest battlement at the Shrine of Assyrian, just observing all the known world, kind of taking it in, everything he's seeing all at once, and he's just looking out for opportunities to be of use to serve the god Assyrian. His next big sort of campaign sortie was in the year 2399 of the Imperial Calendar. And at this time, a Skaven fleet of submersibles had gone past the gates of Lafern and made it into the inner sea of Ulfwan. They made landfall on the shores of Etain, and the Skaven horde packed into those ships poured out onto the shores of Alfwan, and they were met with an army of Sea Guard. Now, the Sea Guard just started firing arrows, all completely disciplined, holding off the Skaven hordes with their spears and bows. However, the Skaven are wily little creatures, and they were not sending their best first. They had sent six huge waves of Skaven slaves ahead of their main forces, and indeed, it had done its job. Most of the Skaven slaves had taken the the arrow fire from the sea guard and their quivers were running extremely low by the time the storm vermin and rat ogres of the ships began to pour forth onto the battlefield coming at them. Now the island was in a huge amount of calamity. If the Skaven managed to break out and make it into the hills of Ulfwan, Ulfwan would be forever tainted with a Skaven infestation. They'd never be able to get rid of them. They would have to stop them here and now. And so it was Caradrian who saw this from the battlements of the Shrine of Assyrian and in a rush gathered forth as many of the available Phoenix Guard as he could and the Phoenixes of the flame spires near the shrine itself. Now, why he didn't see this coming in pre-plan and already be there waiting, never really explained, but he prepares for battle and they fly across. The Phoenix Guard got six man on a Phoenix as they flew across the ocean to go and help out the Sea Guard in their defense of their beloved homeland. Meanwhile, in the battlefield itself, the Sea Guard had actually managed to kill the warlord of the Skaven by the name of Shizgratch of Clan Rictus. Now, he was taken out and they thought, okay, they're going to break now and we can just chase them down. But no, suddenly this chittering started. And it got so, such a high decibel that some of the elves were sure there was some kind of vengeful chanting on behalf of these filthy Skaven as they, with renewed vigor, charged up the beach, seemingly in revenge for their lost warlord. Now, this would be a very rare behavior for the Skaven. I'm pretty sure it more had to do with the fear of how their masters would greet them if they were treated from the battlefield and back to the ships. But anyway, the Skaven renew their charge and the Sea Guard start taking heavy losses. It's it. The line is about to break. And just then, Phoenixes aflame come screeching out the sky, their talons tearing huge rows out of the Skaven backline, completely decimating their number. The sheer weight of the horde against the shields of the Sea Guard began to give way as the Phoenixes began to claw and claw more of the Skaven horde away, tossing them into the air, slashing them open with their talons, setting them on fire with their flames. And so the Sea Guard were able to push the Skaven off and begin their own march down the beach. Now, a sudden roar from the back of the Skaven horde was heard as a huge Skaven abomination came trudging up the beach towards the Sea Guard. This would not be a threat easily dealt with. That is when 
when Caradrin, on top of Ashtari, came swooping out the sky to be involved in the battle themselves. First to strike was his trusted phoenix, digging its talons into the flesh of this monstrosity, tearing away at it, and in its place leaving blistering skin being burnt from the sheer cold of the ancient Frostheart Phoenix. Next, Ashtari swooped back around on itself and went low so that Caradrian could use the Phoenix Blade, his sword he'd been awarded as captain of the Phoenix Guard, to carve slashes into the beast, causing its blood to boil and its flesh to set alight. After half a dozen slashes and passes with his mighty Phoenix, the whole abomination was just a mighty pillar of burning flesh as it succumbed to its choked screams and collapsed on the battlefield. Having seen this monstrous display of power was enough for the Skaven and they broke back to their ships but the captain of the Phoenix Guard was too wise to what might happen and before he'd arrived at the battlefield had split his forces into two with half of the Phoenixes and Phoenix Guard sent to destroy the ships that the Skaven had arrived in. And so trapped between two forces now, the Skaven began to get massacred. Late reinforcements from the City of the Fern came on cavalry and helped to ride down every last Skaven that landed on the beach that day. Although Foresight wasn't his best weapon that day, he was able to see in the present that the island of Ulfwan was at risk and ride to the rescue on board his trusted Phoenix. In terms of his rules on the tabletop, like all Phoenix Guard, he causes fear amongst his enemies because he's quiet. Yep. And uh, he also has, as I mentioned, the mark of a Syrian on his forehead. And the idea of that is that when an enemy kills him, which, you know, how, how often can that really be useful in, in sort of a larger context? But the way it would probably work in Total War Warhammer would be that in the tabletop, if you killed him, you would suffer wounds to yourself. It would work not unlike the curse of the Tomb Kings in Total War Warhammer, where I'm sure if you got him like below 50% health, he'd start to do damage to everyone in a radius around him, or all the enemies in a radius around him. It'd be very similar to that. He also has the Phoenix Blade, which has been passed down from captain to captain of the Phoenix Guard, and that gives plus one strength on the tabletop and flame damage, but also causes D3 wounds. Now, in terms of translation to Total War Warhammer, probably see increased weapon strength, flaming damage, of course, and really the D3 wounds just equates to a higher weapon strength as well. It'd be along those lines. The fact he rides as a mount, his Frostheart Phoenix, you'd get all the cold attributes that they've been given in the Total War Warhammer game. That would be how he'd probably be translated in the game if we ever get to see him. So that's about it for Caradrian. Uh, we are going to move on to another lord, and that is Imric of Kalidor. Imric, the Prince of Kalidor, last in the line of the famous Kalidor Dragon Tamer, the elf responsible for creating the vortex that sucked all the chaos magic out of the Warhammer world, thus saving it from a chaos invasion in ancient days gone past. Imric is the last of that illustrious line, and growing up in Kalidor, in his youth, he had a problem with the parochial and cautious nature of the elves. He had an issue with them being so buttoned down and not really interacting with the world or being more aggressive against the factions that threatened them. However, as a conscientious young man, he managed to conceal this disdain for the overall political climate. As he didn't necessarily want to stick out or make a point in his youth, he'd keep that opinion to himself because above all else really, he prized loyalty and tradition at that time. However, as he grew older, this feeling just grew stronger and stronger, and as more and more responsibility fell on his shoulders with the leadership of the princedom of Kalidor, he started to take action. By the year 2351 of the Imperial Calendar, so some 150 years before the start of the Total War Warhammer timeline, there had been some predictions made by soothsayers uh, within Elven society that dark times were coming. This is all the impetus Imric really needed to get things going and to start to at least make, if nowhere else, the Princedom of Kalidor prepared for the darkness to come. As such, he 
ordered the waking of as many dragons as possible. The smithy fires of Vol's anvils were all to be lit again, and the magical arms that once flowed from that sacral volcanic area would flow again and arm the armies of Kalidor. He almost cared not what the expense, they had to be ready for what was to come. He was sure that regardless of something coming or not, the elves were under threat now, and so started to almost immediately dispatch the armies of Kalidor around the Warhammer world, mainly concentrating on elven colonies to shore them up, to make them safe, to relieve the ones that were under attack from their enemies, and then to fight off any nearby enemies for some of these island colonies. All the while, keeping an eye on the kingdoms of men, for they were friends for now, but they were fragile and corruptible, and would need to be watched. This perhaps resulted in the action he took in the year 2418 of the Imperial Calendar. A huge horde of beastmen were marching through Bretonia and threatening the castle of Caron. Now, Imric himself didn't really care much for this one city of men. It wasn't too much of a concern for him. More important was what was underneath the castle. Caron, like many cities in Bretonia, had been an important aspect of the network of waystones the elves had set up around the Warhammer world, and there was one waystone buried underneath the castle of Caron that needed to be protected. If it fell to the beasts of chaos, then the whole network threatened collapse. So he himself led an army of Kalidor out to back up the Bretonian dukedom of Caron in its time of need. And so the armies of Imric arrived on the shores of Bretonia and lined up with the army of the Bretonian king. Dragon princes sat alongside knights of the realm as they prepared to deal with the oncoming horde of beastmen. The battle was fierce and legendary, and indeed to this very day, bards in Bretonia sing of the great deeds that happened that day. They sing of how Prince Imric and the king at the time, King Charlin, fought like brothers back to back against these monstrosities, taking on every foul gorgon or jabber's life that came at them, dispatching them with great skill and ferocity. A few even claim that the king saved Imric's life that day when Imric was thrown from his mount by an angry Saigor who was then about to crush the young prince when the king himself speared the Saigor straight through the eye, saving the prince's life. Now, Imric, you know, would never own up to that ever having happened. In fact, he remembers that day mainly for the king hanging around him and stealing a lot of his kills, and the elves themselves as a whole respected the Bretonians and thought that their valour almost overshadowed their impertinence. After this battle, Imric returned to Kalidor to rule over his lands once again. And at some point, he gets involved in a conflict with the Druki and gets very badly wounded with a number of blades having fallen upon him. And he's lying there dying in an area known as the Amari Foothills as the Druki close in around him to finish the job. And then just as Imric thinks he has breathed his last, he hears an enormous roar that rocks the mountains around them and a massive dragon swoops Swoops in from the sky, burning all the Druki that were approaching the prince and burnt them alive. Then, just as the prince was losing consciousness, the dragon swooped down and picked him up and flew him back to a city within his princedom so he could be healed. Ever since that day, this great dragon who was called to him through some unknown power has always been at his side, and that dragon was Minethir, and would go on to be Imric's mount and ally from that day forth. The two have a lot in common, as they both come from dwindling bloodlines, and in fact the bloodline of Kalidor Dragon Tamer is thought to be so sacred to the elves, much like the bloodline of his best friend, Anarion, the first Phoenix Kings had on the elves, when the bloodline of Kalidor Dragon Tamer falls away, then it's said that so too will the elves of Ulfwan. In some ways, Imric is a very important character to the elves, but he's made some very 
sparse appearances. He hasn't turned up in a lot of the lore, and I believe he was only a playable character in 6th edition, or that's when he was introduced, and he wasn't really in any of the following army books until the end times, I believe. So, in terms of his rules on the tabletop, he had a weapon known as the Star Lance, with the head of the lance forged from the metal of a fallen star, as it's described. This gave him a bonus to strength on the tabletop, but only on the charge. So really a weapon that would give him a huge charge bonus and maybe just give him a bit of a weapon strength boost as well in terms of how it might possibly make an appearance in Total War Warhammer. He also had something that's either known as the Armor of Kalidor or the Armor of Dragon Tamer. Now the idea is this is an armor that's been in his family for 4,000 years and you know with the Armor of the Dragon Tamer was the very armor that Kalidor Dragon dragon tamer would have worn himself now why he went to close down the vortex or set up the vortex in the defining battle of the first great invasion of chaos without his armor and left it behind for his family who's to say but there's two versions of it and it does slightly different stuff in the original sixth edition version it gave him a very strong armor save of a two plus so he could only really be hit on a one with conventional stuff that could take uh, armor saving throws and in the later version, the armor of Dragon Tamer, uh, which is kind of more the end times version of his stuff, it worked as a 5 plus ward save. So we could see either interpretation in Total War Warhammer if we ever do see Imric introduced. He also, in both versions, had something known as the Dragon Horn. Now, the Dragon Horn is, as the name suggests, made from the horn of an ancient dragon that died in the Battle of the Glade of Tears. Now, as it lay bleeding out, one of its horns already severed from its head, it put all its remaining strength into its last horn, and this is the horn that was hollowed out and made into a musical horn, if you will. Now, this allows, in some versions, a reroll of leadership tests, and in other versions, a 12-inch boost to monsters uh, within some 12 inches of Imric. Now, basically, this is just a morale-boosting piece of equipment. We'll see that played out in Total War Warhammer, perhaps just a unbreakable shout for a while that might be a little bit too strong but maybe just a boost to leadership and morale for units within a radius probably a temporary one as opposed to one that's on all the time with you having to blow through a horn as an active ability rather than a banner or something like that so hopefully that's how we'll see it interpreted in the total war warhammer series and the last one it's gone by two different rule names uh, it's called Dragonkin, which is my preferred one, which is the idea that Imric can speak all the languages of dragons. So he can converse with them, and this would prevent any dragon from ever wanting to fight him. That was the idea with the dragon kin rule. They'd just be like, oh, he's my buddy. I'm not going to try and bite his head off. He can speak my language. He's one of mine. So they leave him alone. The interpretation of the Lord of Dragon rules, which is slightly similar but different, just meant they had a lesser chance to hit. Now, in the Total War Warhammer series, you're probably not going to be able to make him immune to attacks from a certain type of animal. So we'll probably see a massive melee defense against dragons or something like that, something along those lines. Um, maybe a big fire resistance as well, something that speaks to both of the abilities that dragons have. So that's how I see Imric playing out uh, with the rules that he's had in the past on the tabletop. And we will hopefully one day see Imric leading the Dragon Princes on the battlefields of Total War Warhammer. So moving on from Imric, we are going to go with an important character, but a character who perhaps is in the backseat for a lot of the modern history of the elves in Warhammer. And that is the Phoenix King himself. Finibar. And so some of you might rightfully wonder why is the Phoenix King, the leader of the Elves of Alfwan, so far down my list? And it's simply because he's never really been much of an impact player on the tabletop. And in fact, Finibar, unlike maybe some of his Phoenix King predecessors, has not done a lot of legendary tasks on the battlefield that bards will sing of. He's more of a, basically, an economist who's pretty good at it and does a lot of good work behind the scenes. But to begin the story of Finibar, we really have to go back to the rule of the previous Phoenix King, Bel Hathor. Now, Bel Hathor went on to become known as Bel Hathor the Sage, and he had drawn up the world and had decided that 
the elves of Ulfwan should continue being closed off for the world, but he had the forethought to ask a well-known sailing prince who'd done a fair bit of traveling around to investigate in detail what was going on with the realms of men. For a very long time, Ulfwan had been cut off from the rest of the world and had not really been involved, but men had been kind of an emerging power when they'd done it, just some weird primitives living in caves, but it's been a while and I've heard they've made some progress, so go and do some investigative work, and he sent Finubar, the Prince of Etain. And so Finubar set sail across the seas and made his way to the Old World, as men would later on call it. He said to have first landed at the city of Longri, which had many, many years ago fallen to the dwarves. In the last time the elves really had any kind of public exposure to this continent in the Warhammer world was after the War of the Beard, or the War of Vengeance, depending on whose side you're on, where the elves and the dwarves really fought themselves into ruination. Now, Finnebar, upon having his first contact with men, was both impressed and appalled at the same time at what he saw. He saw cities teeming with people. Now, bear in mind, they had some exposure to Norskan raiding parties, and he thought all humans were like that. You know, primitives, loincloths, axes, mental. But no, he saw teeming cities with city walls capable of defending themselves against things like orcs and beastmen. He saw armies with great discipline who could fight and protect these cities. He was overall pretty impressed and just amazed by the huge numbers of people within these cities. The elves themselves had had dwindling numbers for centuries and there were far fewer of them with even some of their cities in Ulfwan and fields lying abandoned and untended to. And it didn't take him long to realize that it was much better to have these men as allies rather than enemies and he believed upon seeing the progress they'd made in such a relatively short time for the elves that indeed these men would one day eclipse the Eldar themselves. Having been sort of roaming around Bretonia, he also obviously got wind of the elves living in the woods of Athalorn, and so was the first to encounter his long-lost cousins who had been left ever since the War of the Beard. And so he made first contact and he was amazed to see how much they'd changed, how different they were from the elves of Alfwan, how much they'd become integrated with life in the woodland realm. And although they were friendly to Finnebar, kind of emissaries after his initial contact haven't been welcomed nearly as warmly, and there's kind of an indifference from the Wood Elves as far as their relationship with the Elves of Ulfwan is concerned. Now, he spent 50 years traveling around the realm of men, of seeing Britannia, seeing the Empire, really getting a sense of where they were and what they were capable of, and that's when he returned to the court of the Phoenix King and presented his findings. Having seen his findings and taken in his advice, Belhafor agreed with Finibar that they should open themselves up to trade and relationships with the realms of men. And so began a huge boom. Now, one cynically might be able to argue that Finibar being the prince of Etain, with his capital city being Lefern, had a vested interest in encouraging trade as it was the largest port city uh, within the elven realms and trade over this time exploded the economy of Lafern. It went from, you know, a decent sized hub of trading within elven society, really more of a kind of port of defense against anyone trying to get into the inner sea, to the largest trading port in the whole of the Warhammer world, making his princedom a hugely influential one within elven society. So, after some time passes, trade with men is allowed. Some men are allowed on the shores of Alfwad, where they had never been allowed to go before. Seeing it, they were wondered at the stuff the elves had managed to do, and it really opened up relationships between the two peoples. Such had the success of this been, and the challenges of the new world been presented in having to affect the elves so much more than it had in millennia past, that when Belhafor was coming to the end of his rule, he actually was the first Phoenix King to be able to pick and suggest his successor, and he picked Finibar, and the Council of Princes voted him into power with that wish. 
And so Finnebar became the Phoenix King in the year 2163 of the Imperial Calendar, so roughly around 340 years before the start of the Total War Warhammer timeline. Now, when all this responsibility was placed on Finnebar's shoulders, he didn't really take it very well. He enjoyed his way of life, his sailing around, his building new trade routes, and he wanted to keep doing it. And so for long periods of time during his early reign, Philippa would just disappear for months, years on end. No one was sitting in the court of the Phoenix King. He was just away. And this caused a certain degree of unrest, as some might imagine. And inevitably, plots started to build around maybe taking him off, replacing him as the Phoenix King. And that's when the Ever Queen came in and interfered and was like, no, you fools, he's the Phoenix King, don't theff around or you'll have to answer to me. And so she put an end to all that and really filled a leadership void, which, you know, she would do anyway as the Ever Queen, but in some ways the Ever Queen has been like the Pope versus a president, if you will, with the Ever Queen being the spiritual leader and the... Phoenix King being the actual leader of stuff on the ground. At least that's the best analogy I can really come up with as far as the elves are concerned. Now, while on his travels, Finnebar's having a whale of a time. He's having adventures. He's saving princesses in Ind, which actually got him a sword that's able to project magical fire and light out of it uh, from a magical, mystical kingdom in Ind where he saved a princess once. So he's off having jolly old adventures. And after some time, eventually settles down and comes back to Alf One and his sort of adventures and dalliances get a little bit less frequent as time goes on. In the year 2301 of the Imperial Calendar, Finnebar kind of has the greatest challenge he ever has to face, and that is a chaos incursion. The Dark Elves, with some Norsken raiders, launch a huge invasion of Ulfwan, and they very nearly succeed. This culminates in the Battle of Fenuvial Plain, where Tyrion and Teclis, the twins, emerge as champions of Ulfwan and help defeat Malekith and his mother at the Battle of the Fenuvial Plain. Now, the issue here is that Finubar, this whole time, is where you'd think he'd rise to prominence and be the one to lead the charge against the enemy. His court in Lafern is completely under siege. He is just not able to escape. He can't get out. There's no way for him to go and help the rest of the kingdom. For most of this entire war, he's just trapped behind the gates of Lafern. Now, it's not necessarily a cowardly thing. It's just that strategically, if they marched out, they'd be beaten, but they knew they could hold the city. And so they, he just gets stuck in a stalemate for almost the whole of this trouble. And this sums up a lot of what actually happens with Finibar. When the time does come and Fenuvial Battle of Fenuvial Plains 1, he does ride out and help clear out the battle. And he has two new champions in the face of Tyrion and Teclis to help him and do some work with him. Now, Teclis, immediately after this time, leaves to go and help the realms of men. But Tyrion sticks around and becomes almost a champion of the Phoenix King as well as the Ever Queen, and becomes a very useful leader for the High Elves. But it kind of puts Finubar even more as a backseat. Now that he can rely on Tyrion to lead armies and, you know, take out the capital's army and lead them for him, he doesn't really have to do that anymore. So he kind of withdraws even more from Elven society. The Chaos Incursion also brought with it the coronation of a new Ever Queen. She was at her weakest, but this was the Ever Queen that Finubar was meant to marry. The Ever Queen and the Phoenix King are always meant to come as one to give birth to the new Ever Queen. This is just the way the system of the elves work. Now, I'm not sure exactly how they time it out in terms of daughters not having to marry their dads, but they managed to do it because elves are long lived. I suppose they can wait around for a new Phoenix King to be elected, and if the Phoenix King's married, does he then have to get divorced? There's a lot of unanswered questions as far as I'm concerned with the Phoenix King Ever Queen uh, relationship that I don't think I've ever really read a fantastic explanation of in the Warhammer lore. Suffice to say, new Ever Queen is coronated and she is the one who is expected to marry Finnebar and give birth to the next generation Ever Queen. Time progresses and things start to go a bit wrong for Finnebar. There's still a lot of stuff going on, but he's never really directly involved in solving many of these problems. 
There are near constant Norsken raids. There is the great green skin incursion of Grom the Ponch that Eltharion eventually had to deal with. There's the assassination attempt, year 2307, that Corhill helped protect him from, the leader of the White Lions, that he managed to survive. But a lot of things tend to happen to Finnegbar as far as the great stories of the elves are concerned. And he's very rarely engaged directly in solving those problems. Which is why we may never see him as a character in the Total War Warhammer series. More as someone behind the scenes sending you notes and giving you orders of stuff to do. At some point, it is believed that Finnebar does successfully impregnate the Everqueen. And they have a beautiful daughter by the name of Aliathra. But there are dark rumours swirling that all may not be as it appears with the Everqueen's child. But to think such sacrilegious thoughts would surely be blasphemous. And what kind of Everqueen would ever debase herself in such rumoured ways? To perhaps find out a bit more about the source of these dark rumours, do check out my Alariel Law video popping up in the top right hand corner now, or you'll find a link in the description below to get to the bottom of these filthy rumours about the child of the Everqueen. But by all accounts, he's a proud daddy. But that's really the Phoenix King, never really had any rules on the tabletop. And I think it's written kind of cleverly that because he's never really been of huge impact militarily. So... Warhammer is at its core a game of war, and if you have a Phoenix King who doesn't really lead anyone to war, he's often not mentioned. And so this is why he might make an appearance, but he also might never make an appearance in the Total War Warhammer series, simply because he's not that kind of Phoenix King. He's not like Anarian, the first Phoenix King, a fantastic warrior, general, and leader. He's not like a few of the others. He is an economist who enjoys trade and diplomacy, and you know what? People don't sing about those things a whole bunch. They tend not to write great tales about them, and so Finnebar is slightly in the background, and it doesn't help that in sort of later Warhammer times in his reign, he kind of disappears off for long periods of time, not on sailing trips like he used to, but just locks himself in his study and no one can get to him. And so people are trying to have to rule while the man is in absentia. So stuff, decisions are made either by the Everqueen, or at some point later on, Tyrion becomes kind of a mouthpiece for the king as well. There's still the Council of Princes, who are able to make a lot of decisions by themselves, but there seems to be a lack of any sort of real direct leadership from the Phoenix King towards the later part of his realm as we go into the era of the end times. So that's really it for Fidibar the Phoenix King. Moving on from Fidibar, we're gonna include a character who I don't think will make an appearance, but I think I should mention because I think at some point I may do a series on the end times. And this is a character that does turn up there a little bit. And so I think it's worth mentioning her in this video. And that is Princess Eldira. Now to understand the story of Princess Eldira, we have to go back to the year 2,339 of the Imperial Calendar, some 160 years before the start of the Total War Warhammer timeline. The Dark Elves have invaded the Shadowlands and they are met by a force led by Tyrion and his friend Prince Eldia of Tyrannoch. Now, together, they manage to fight back this Dark Elf invasion, but at a very high cost, and that is the cost of Eldia's life. So the Prince of Tyrannoch is dead, and his daughter, Eldira, takes up his sword and vows that she will serve the Phoenix King in her father's place. The following year, she's managed to get all her house in order and presents herself at the court of the Phoenix King along with the other leading princes of Ulfwan. There, she's met really with scorn and derision. The princes don't really want another rival, yet alone some young girl turning up and throwing spanners in their plans and machinations. So they give her the cold shoulder, starts off as a chilly reception, and by the first hour or so, just launches into open mockery. Eldira, you know, being a young girl that she is, this being a high-pressure situation, decides to leave, and she leaves in floods of tears, and goes somewhere to hide her anger and her shame. 
Tyrion, who is not present in the court at this time, because during this period of his life, he's not a fan of the goings-on in court. If there's an army to be led, he'll go and do it. If there's a duel to be fought, he'll go and fight it. But he's not going to sit around with the bureaucratic princes and plan out the in-and-out daily runnings of the island of Ulfwan. So he wasn't there, but he got wind of it later on. And being the daughter of his dear friend, he went, screw this, and went to go and find her. And there he swore to her that he would find a way to make her dreams come true as her father was his dear friend the next day Tyrion walks in and announces he has a new squire now Tyrion is a fighting legend at this point he's won the battle of Fenuvial Plain he's won countless tournaments and duels and is a true hero of the entirety of Ulfwan his squire must be a grand warrior to earn the tutelage of perhaps the greatest fighter in high elf society and then in walks Eldira she was not met with scorn or derision that day and from there and ever since she served as Tyrion's squire, learning how to fight in his way, learning how to be a general, learning how to lead armies. By the year 2374, she has proven herself in the eyes of Tyrion and the eyes of Ulfwan nobility and has become a general in her own right. As far as her mount is concerned, being from Tyrannoch, a place famous for its chariots, unlike other nobility from the region, she never managed to pick up the gift of riding the chariots because she was learning alongside Tyrion and Tyrion's mighty steed was fast and a chariot could not hope to keep up. And so she she too had learned to fight with her horse Maldoros, which was not as quick as Tyrion's horse Malhandir, but you know could kind of do its best to keep up. And so that's how she fought and she got one of her most difficult assignments when a champion of chaos known as Sigvald sailed to the lands of Ulfwan. It said that Sigvald had grown tired of hearing the stories of how beautiful the hair of the elves was, thinking himself the owner of the most beauteous hair in the Warhammer world, he set about assembling a host of chaos to go and burn and pillage this silly little island. However, Sigvald was not met with the force he expected. He could not find an army to fight. In the night, his lieutenants would be assassinated and he'd wake up every morning with fresh corpses of his leading officers. Over the day, they'd be harried from hidden places by bows. Any soldiers that fell behind were picked off by harrying cavalry. He could not find a straight fight even when he was looking for one. Nor could he find any towns to aim at. He couldn't find anything to do and he was losing troops by the day. So much so that his own lieutenants had started to rise up against him and he was fighting duels, killing them nearly daily. By the end of a few weeks, he'd killed as many lieutenants tenants as had been murdered by these agents in the night. Things were not going well, and this was all down to the tactics of Eldira. She had insisted on a campaign of harassment. She used shadow warriors and reavers for quick strikes and hidden kills, assassinations for taking out the leadership of the army and causing dissent among its ranks, and then she saw her opportunity. Such dissent, such chaos was engulfing the camp. It seemed like this Sigvald was having yet another duel. Now was the perfect time to strike strike, their army in complete disarray and relatively unprotected. And so she led a charge of high elf cavalry down upon this chaos horde, shattering it almost with a single charge as the chaos horde scattered in disarray. Sigvald himself is said to have just wandered off from the battlefield, kind of being sick of this whole campaign, killing any friend or foe who got in his way as he wandered to the shoreline and set sail for the old world once again. This is an example of Eldira's cunning. Having hidden the elven cities with magic, she'd managed to foil Sigvald's campaign into the heart of the home of the elves. 
This was such a disastrous campaign, it would come known as Sigvald's Folly, and he would be derided, obviously never to his face about it, forever after. So, Aldira probably would be a hero character if we ever saw her in the Total War Warhammer series, and I think we'd only ever see her with a kind of end times campaign pack, or something along those lines, is when we'd maybe see her, and that's why she's maybe made the end of my list here. But a fun character, another female character for the High Elves to draw upon, and you know what, it's nothing to be sniffed at, having been trained and taught to fight and do war by Tyrion, probably the greatest High Elf at it. And so that is the end of our little episode here, guys. I hope you enjoyed our Missing Legendary Lords of the High Elves video. Do subscribe and check out the playlist for more content on the Legendary Lords of Warhammer. And as always, guys, uh, thank you all for watching, and I'll catch you all on the next one.